Well, this is the last time that I will say hello again, and welcome to our final module here in our course. Uh, we've been spending the last eight weeks looking at the ethics of food. Now it's time to finally draw our discussion to a close. And I want to give uh, just a brief conclusion uh, to what we've done over the past eight weeks. Uh, and really just highlight what I see as some of the key themes and questions uh, raised by this study, uh, and also prompt uh, just some concluding thoughts of your own uh, on Blackboard, and uh, more importantly, as you go on through this class to uh, finish up your degrees or uh, to go on about your life's work. Uh, so I want to keep this module uh, relatively brief uh, and hopefully just uh, plant some seeds for thought uh, to, to wrap things up here. To do that, I really want to start uh, by going back to the beginning of the class. If you recall, uh, oh, so many weeks ago, we started off by looking at uh, the Christian worldview uh, and theological anthropology to think uh, kind of very fundamentally about how do we understand the world around us? How do we understand the nature of the human person? And it's really essential that we figure those things out before we move on to talk about uh, how to live, uh, and then more specifically, how to eat, how to shop, uh, and how to do those things. And so again, uh, to really kind of bring this course uh, to conclusion, I think we have to step back and ask, our, ask ourselves, uh, what do we ultimately believe about uh, creation, uh, the world around us, the human person? Uh, does that uh, Christian vision that we looked at at the beginning of the class, uh, does that really seem true to us? Do we really find it to be true? Uh, now, part of uh, how we can make that sort of decision about whether or not uh, that view of the world is true is we can look at, well, what are the consequences from it? Uh, and we've spent uh, the last couple of months uh, looking at, well, if we take this view of the human person and of the world seriously, What's that going to mean in terms of how we should eat, uh, how we should farm, how we should uh, raise animals for food? And we've seen uh, that it gives us some fairly specific guidelines for how we need to do that. Uh, and in many ways, uh, it would seem we should do that in ways differently than our society does uh, today. Uh, so if we find those critiques uh, to be true, if we find that vision of how we ought to live our lives in relation to food, uh, to seem true, to seem right. That's going to be uh, another piece of evidence in support of accepting that Christian view of the human person and that Christian view uh, of the world around us. Now, obviously, if you don't hold uh, the Christian worldview or view of the human person, uh, that's probably going to change in some ways how you think about how we ought to eat uh, and how we ought to produce our food. Uh, now, it doesn't necessarily need to be totally and completely different. Uh, we've talked at a couple points during the class, I think, uh, about how natural law, that is the primary ethical system that comes from that basic Christian worldview, uh, can also be held by people who aren't necessarily Christian. Natural law is traced back to uh, Aristotle, uh, who certainly isn't a Christian, but who uh, had an understanding of the human person and an understanding of the world that was in many ways uh, very similar to and compatible with the Christian view. So he would reach similar conclusions about how we should live, uh, and I would think if he were alive today, he could also reach similar conclusions about how agriculture ought to happen and how we ought to eat. Uh, so it's not to say that if you're not Christian, uh, all of the stuff that we've covered up uh, to this point in the class isn't really going to apply. Uh, it's simply to say it's important every now and then to step back and ask those really basic questions about what do I believe about life? What do I think about um, the world around me? Is it just uh, the result of random chance and accidents and therefore there is no built-in meaning, there is no built-in value, uh, and therefore we should just uh, make our own values. We can choose basically to do whatever it is we want, uh, which might lead us to simply saying, hey, uh, we ought to uh, live in the moment, get as much pleasure as we can. Um, I, I couldn't help but put up a picture of Jersey Shore here as an example of that sort of lifestyle. Obviously, there are more serious uh, non-Christian lifestyles out there than the Jersey Shore option. Uh, but 
again, if we, if we see the world as essentially random chance with no meaning in it, um, we might very well reach the conclusion that we should uh, live in ways that simply maximize our pleasure uh, from day to day. Uh, but if we do believe there's meaning and value, I think it's going to force us to uh, sometimes put off pleasure, sometimes uh, not take what's going to be the most profitable or the most pleasurable route in pursuit of something that's higher, something more important. Uh, and all different religions, all different philosophies, uh, at least for the most part, have argued that there are many times in life we have to do that. We have to put off pleasure, profit, uh, comfort, in order to attain some higher good that we believe is ultimately important. So again, once we figure out what we basically believe about the world and about our lives, then we have to think about, well, what are the choices that are going to follow from that? We saw how uh, from the Christian worldview and view of the human person, uh, natural law ethics uh, seem to follow. Uh, for other views of the world, other beliefs, uh, other ethical systems might follow as well. We've looked at utilitarianism uh, as one example of that. But again, that's a necessary step you have to take. And when you think about ethics, when you start uh, seriously considering what's the best way to live, what's the right way to live, uh, sometimes this is going to be difficult to figure out what the right answer is, uh, and in many times, many cases, it's going to lead us uh, to conclusions that we're not entirely comfortable with, that are going to uh, make us realize that there's something that we do, uh, some choices or actions that we make, uh, which aren't in fact right, or at least we would very much like to do certain things uh, that it seems, once we really think about it, are not the right way uh, to live, the right way to act. Uh, and so ethics should be challenging, it should be hard. Uh, there are really tough cases out there in the world, uh, and there are also, uh, pretty much in everyone's experience, I think, going to be instances where our own desires are going to be um, contrary to what we know, what we determine to be the right way to live. And then, of course, we have to ask ourselves, are we really living this out, right? Are we really acting consistently with the ethical system that we should hold based on our basic beliefs about the world uh, and human persons. Uh, and if we're not being really, truly consistent, which I think for the vast majority of us is going to be the case, there's going to be some, at least some areas uh, where we recognize the need for change, then there's real practical questions about how do we make those changes? How should we uh, alter our daily life? Or how should we alter some major aspects of our life? in order to better fit with our beliefs and our ethics. Um, and then finally, how can we uh, help make those positive changes possible for other people as well? And hopefully as you've uh, been listening to this, you can see that this is basically the way we've worked through the class, uh, is to think about, well, what's really the right way to live? What really matters? Uh, and then, uh, well, look, are we actually doing that, specifically in regard to food? Um, are we producing our food in a way that fits with these beliefs, uh, and if not, in many cases, how can we change that? How can we as individuals change that, and how can we work uh, to make it possible for other people uh, to live better lives in relation to food as well? And so again, I understand that for many of you, this is a class. You, you have to take it. Uh, it's a degree requirement. Uh, but hopefully, uh, this uh, class and the readings and materials have started you to think about how food really matters, and uh, to at least raise those questions about what is the right way to eat. Uh, and then as we move forward, we can think about how can we make real practical changes uh, in our own lives, and how can we uh, encourage changes in our American food system that's really going to make things uh, truly better for everyone, and not just more profitable or more pleasurable uh, here in the moment. All right, well, uh, that's the, the, the grand uh, synopsis conclusion. What I want to do then, just on the next couple of pages, uh, is to highlight what I think are some basic conclusions about the American food system that everyone can agree to, uh, and then conclude with some critiques uh, and questions uh, to wrap up with. All right, as we've gone through the class, especially this last half, uh, we've been looking at different topics, the relationship with food and animal, environment, workers, what have you. Pretty much all of those cases, there's uh, quite a bit of controversy about whether or not the current way we do things uh, is the right way, uh, is the moral way, or whether some major changes are needed 
Uh, and then, there, of course, there would be further questions about what changes are really necessary. So uh, I won't presume that everybody agrees with the criticisms that have been raised about the modern American food system, especially over these last uh, four or five weeks of the class. But I do think that there are some things uh, that all of us should be able to agree on, having taken some time to really think about uh, food and how we eat uh, and how we produce uh, all of that food that we eat. Um, most basically is that eating is important. Right? This is one of those things that we all do uh, simply as a matter of course. Right? At least in America, most of us have the uh, relative luxury of not having to spend a lot of time thinking about how am I going to get my food from day to day? How am I going to be able to feed myself and my family? Uh, now, obviously, some of us are going to be a little tight on the grocery budget, uh, but we tend to not really reflect on uh, the importance of eating because it's just something that's just part of our daily uh, ritual, so to speak. But in lots of different ways throughout the class, we've looked at how eating uh, really is important. Obviously, it's essential for uh, keeping us alive uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. But beyond that, it has a real impact on our life or in terms of natural law, in terms of our flourishing and in the pursuit of some basic goods like bodily health, but also relationships with others, uh, peace of mind, and all of those things. And we've looked at uh, also how eating, uh, again, obviously affects our health, but it also has a far-reaching impact on uh, a lot of other things. Uh, it has an impact on the uh, environment, on plants and animals and ecosystems. Uh, it has an even more direct impact on the lives of the animals that we get our milk and eggs from and also the animals that we get our meat from. Uh, how we eat affects uh, workers in uh, fields in uh, Florida or in Texas or in California. It has an effect on people who work uh, in confined animal feeding operations. Uh, it has impact on uh, local communities, on rural communities, uh, communities that are decreasing from the consolidation of agriculture, or communities that are dealing with uh, feedlots and other kinds of uh, confined animal operations in their neighborhood. And so uh, when we go to the store, when we make our, our food purchases, uh, obviously, yes, that has an impact on us and our health and on our family. But when we, we make those purchases, we're getting involved in a system. Uh, and this big social system affects lots of other people, uh, affects the world, and affects uh, all kinds of plants and animals. And so it's important to, again, reflect on that at least from time to time. Obviously, we can't uh, do an exhaustive uh, you know, catalog of all of the effects every time we're choosing between two different cans of tomatoes. Uh, but again, it is something that uh, is true and it is something that really matters and something that we should, uh, I think, all agree that we should reflect on. Because I think we would all uh, hopefully agree that we ought to do what's right, right? That we ought to think about what are the right ways to live, what are the right choices to make, uh, and then to really do them. Uh, even if we might disagree about whether or not modern food system is, is moral or uh, an improvement or a, um, a worse option than traditional uh, models. But whatever our views on that might be, uh, we should be willing to agree that we ought to make the right choice, that we ought to make the choice that is going to be best for ourselves and for others. Um, I think we can also all agree that there has been a real change in uh, American food. And this is, again, I think something important uh, for us to reflect on. Now here in Kansas we have a little more connection with it perhaps than in other parts of uh, the country, but still for many of us I think uh, we're not really really aware of these changes on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, we don't really think about how radically different uh, our food system is than it was uh, 100 years ago and for the vast majority of history uh, before that. Uh, we spend much less time, much less energy uh, on getting our food on a daily basis uh, than really any other people throughout world history have done. Uh, and again, we all know the little cliche, uh, out of sight, out of mind. Uh, when we don't have to 
grapple with how the food gets to our table, um, that's going to allow uh, all kinds of things to happen and develop, uh, perhaps which if we were aware of, we would be more concerned about. And I think, again, uh, everyone would agree, uh, except perhaps the most die-hard uh, corporate promoters, everybody's going to agree that there are at least some costs to this green revolution that don't necessarily show up uh, in a balance sheet or in uh, the cost of the grocery store. And it certainly has had an impact on uh, the environment. It has had an impact on rural communities, on workers, on the way animals are raised. Uh, so everybody would agree that there are um, some real costs that go along with our low, low prices at the grocery store uh, and our very convenient uh, fast food. Of course, the question then is, uh, are those costs uh, too great to be justified, or are the costs acceptable given the benefits uh, of the Green Revolution? And to ponder those sorts of questions, uh, we'll go ahead and turn now to the final page. Obviously, up through this point in the class, I haven't uh, tried to maintain uh, some sort of an artificial neutrality on a lot of these issues. I've basically been convinced over the past few years of working on uh, these sorts of issues, reading through a lot of this material, that there are significant problems with the way uh, we produce food. And I think uh, many of the critiques that we've looked at uh, over the course of the past few weeks are uh, valid and are important and really do require us to make some changes uh, in how we as a country, uh, particularly a country with a role of leadership in the world, how we produce our food. Um, and basically, uh, I think you could sum up many of these critiques with the idea that what we have essentially done is that we have uh, exchanged more important higher goods uh, for lower ones. Namely, that we have uh, decided to sacrifice uh, things like the true good of creation, uh, like social relationships, uh, like uh, proper stewardship and care for animals, um, basic human dignity in some cases, uh, and perhaps more nebulously, but real, nonetheless, uh, a real spiritual fulfillment. We've been willing to sacrifice those things in exchange for uh, convenience, in exchange for low cost, in exchange for uh, profitability. And basically, uh, no one sits down and, of course, decides to do this. No one sits down and says, yeah, I think uh, today with my meal I want to uh, damage the environment and make some animals suffer uh, and degrade some workers in Florida. Nobody thinks that way. But instead what we've done is uh, in infinitesimal choices that each of us make day by day, uh, we opt for the cheap, the convenient, the easy. Um, over uh, the slower, the perhaps more expensive, uh, the perhaps more requiring more effort options, which would have uh, those higher goods along with them. And of course, that's understandable. We're all busy people. Uh, but we do need to step back and reflect on, well, what is the sum result of all these different choices that we make? Uh, and I think when we look at that, we can see uh, that as a system, as a society as a whole, we've done precisely that, that we've given up uh, some important things uh, for some quick, cheap, easy uh, fulfillment that's not really in our best interest. Um, even if it might be okay for each individual choice, the, the sum result of it all uh, is not something that we're willing to accept. And of course, this is what uh, makes it complicated because uh, we are all involved in this. Uh, in some way. We're involved as consumers, uh, we're involved as citizens with a government that is complicit in all of this, we're involved as uh, investors in corporations uh, or supporters of the economy in general. And so uh, there's no quick and easy answer. We can't just say, oh, well, look, the farmers need to do a better job or the government needs to regulate more. Uh, because with social systems like this, with social sin like this, uh, trying to address it, trying to figure out who's responsible and what needs to change is complicated. It is uh, difficult. Uh, and in almost every case, there are multiple parties who are responsible. And I think that's uh, certainly the case here in regard to the food system. So, 
if our food system really is uh, significantly flawed, if we really have, as a society, uh, made the choice of pursuing lower goods and sacrificing higher ones, how should we go about changing that? Um, well, again, I think we have to step back and ask some basic questions. Say, look, do we really believe uh, in this basic Christian worldview, this view of the human person? If yes, uh, well, then that means uh, that these issues really are important. If we really were created to be stewards, if we really were created to be relational beings, if we really were uh, created to uh, flourish, to uh, flourish as body and soul together, then these things really do matter. This isn't just, oh, well, you know, they're real issues and there's this kind of environmental foody stuff. That doesn't really matter. Uh, I think if we think about it seriously, uh, we can see, yes, it really uh, does matter. And if that's the case, then we really do need to make some changes. So how do we do that? Um, I think, to be honest, uh, to really change the system, it's going to require some pretty radical changes. Uh, we can't just um, you know, spend a couple cents more here and there and everything will be OK. Uh, because the whole system, as we've seen uh, in multiple different ways now, has shifted towards uh, maximizing production, minimizing uh, human effort and involvement uh, in order to uh, lower costs and increase profits. Basically, any significant change is going to have to reverse a lot of that, to put in a lot more human effort, uh, a lot more manpower, less reliance on big machines uh, and chemicals, but, of course, that's going to require real changes in how we as Americans live, where we spend more on our food, where we spend more time on our food, where more of us work uh, in the production of food, uh, and less time, less money, uh, less employees involved in other aspects of the economy. And that's a pretty radical uh, change. And so, again, we have to ask, is it really worth it? Uh, and if so, then, again, we can... Uh, ask the question, okay, how on earth could we possibly get started with this? Uh, and here, again, some of you have already talked about this on Blackboard, uh, but there are a number of different ways. Uh, now, one response would be to say, uh, well, look, a radical restructuring of American society is not really something that I can pull off, so I'm just going to go along with things like they are, which is, I suppose, an understandable response. But again, it doesn't really work if we really believe the things that many Christians at least claim we believe, and many other uh, people of good conscience from other faiths believe, uh, that's not really an acceptable option. So if we're going to work to change, how do we do that? Um, well, we can do on an individual level uh, what society as a whole needs to do. Put in more time, put in more effort, put in more thought to our food, to how we get our food, whether it's gardening, whether it's uh, supporting local farmers as much as we can, whether it is uh, talking about the issues with other people, whether it's writing letters to government officials. There are all, for all of us, many little ways that we can go about changing this. And again, it might seem impossible, but I think that story of the tomato workers uh, is a, a useful one uh, to include in the class, because you wouldn't think, uh, how on earth could a bunch of uh, probably pretty poorly educated certainly very poor uh, immigrant workers in South Florida, how could they change the policies of a corporation like Taco Bell, which is a huge, powerful uh, corporation? But in fact, they managed to do it, right? And they managed to do it uh, not through huge political connections, but through um, a bunch of individuals getting together and deciding to really make a change. Uh, and so I think, while it might seem daunting, real change is possible. Uh, and even if society as a whole doesn't change for a while, uh, if we make some of these changes ourselves, I think uh, we can find the benefits personally uh, to be worth it as we work for the bigger change in society. Uh, so uh, we will wrap up our discussion of the ethics of food uh, there for now. Uh, and again, I would just encourage you as you leave this class to just to periodically think about these things, to think about how your choices really fit with uh, your basic beliefs. Uh, and obviously, uh, the final point here would be to say, 
So this isn't just the case with food, right? That we should really think about what it is we truly believe about life, about the human person, about the world, uh, and then look at all the different aspects of our lives. Let's ask ourselves, does, uh, do our actions, do our choices really fit with our beliefs, uh, whether it comes to the career we choose, uh, the way we uh, date and marry, the way we raise our children, uh, the way we uh, act as consumers, all of these things, are our actions really fitting with our basic beliefs, or are we choosing what's um, convenient and pleasurable uh, and cheap? Um, and again, if we can examine our lives periodically uh, and make uh, the right choices, even if it's difficult, then I think that will help us get to uh, that flourishing life uh, that really is, I think, uh, the ultimate goal for all of us.